The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. We are particularly wary of revealing fears and vulnerabilities, which we believe will make us look weak. In reality, people tend to seek courage and honesty in our declarations, a phenomenon called the beautiful mess effect. By practising greater self-disclosure in our lives and exposing our authentic personalities, we can put ourselves on the fast track to deeper friendship. Hi everyone, it's Tuesday. I'm your host, Michael Kavnat, and this is The Next Big Idea Daily. So do you know what matters to your health, happiness, and career more than just about anything? It's your relationships. But even though the evidence is stacking up that our connections with others are vital to thriving, most of us don't know how to go about creating and maintaining relationships that work. Here to help us out is David Robson, author of the new book, The Laws of Connection, The Scientific Secrets of Building a Strong Social Network. David is an award-winning science writer and the author of the previous books, The Intelligence Trap and The Expectation Effect. Here he is to share five of his big ideas. My first tip concerns a bit of introspection about the relationships that you currently have. I hope that most of the people in your social circle will be purely supportive. You know that they'll be there for you when you would like help, and they rarely hurt your feelings. Most of us will also know a few people who are consistently unpleasant. They are best avoided. But what about the people in between? Those Jekyll and Hyde personalities who might act like your best friend one moment, but lash out the next or the colleague that promises to be there for you in a crisis, but then ignores your emails when you need their support. You might know these people as frenemies, but to scientists, they are called ambivalent relationships, and their research suggests that they cause more damage to our health and happiness than the purely aversive people, whom we can more easily discount. By blowing hot and cold, ambivalent frenemies leave us in a state of uncertainty and stress whenever we know that we're going to have to interact with them. Simply being told that they're sitting in the next room is enough to raise our blood pressure. By learning to recognise our frenemies, we can manage our expectations when we next see them, or we can even choose to avoid them altogether if we think they're causing us more harm than good. Just as importantly, we might analyse our own behaviours and question whether we are unwittingly putting others into a state of stress with our unreliable behaviour. Overcoming the liking gap Have you ever enjoyed a pleasant conversation with a stranger, only to walk away and mull over all the clumsy things that you think you said? If so, you might have suffered from a phenomenon called the liking gap. Research by Erica Boothby at the University of Pennsylvania and colleagues has shown that most of us consistently underestimate how much other people have enjoyed our company. After meeting a new acquaintance, each person walks away believing that they liked the other person more than the other person liked them. Or put another way, we are generally much more appealing than we believe. The liking gap can persist after many meetings. A study of college roommates found that they experienced these anxieties for the best part of an academic year. The liking gap can discourage us from building on our rapport with someone to build a strong, lasting friendship, even when the connection that we crave is standing right in front of us. In the workplace, the liking gap can limit our potential for creative collaborations and prevent us from giving or receiving honest feedback that might help future progress. You can overcome the liking gap with practice. Next time that you meet someone whom you like and respect, try to be the first person to say how much you enjoyed the conversation, and suggest that you might meet a second time. You must of course respect the other person's wishes, if they do not want to build on your connection. But the research suggests that they will likely respond far more warmly than you expect. 
practice self-disclosure, and reveal your vulnerability. Another psychological barrier concerns the content of our conversations. Thanks to our natural reserve, many of us stick to superficial subjects that leave little room for us to share our intimate thoughts and feelings. This is unfortunate since meaningful social connections can only emerge when two people share their inner worlds. Don't believe me? Just consider the following conversation prompts that are designed to encourage self-disclosure. For what in your life do you feel most grateful? If a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself, your life, your future, or anything else, what would you like to know? If you could undo one mistake that you have made in your life, what would it be, and why would you undo it? When asked to talk about these topics with a new acquaintance, most people worry that the conversation will be extremely awkward. Compared to standard small talk about someone's background or what they did on a public holiday. In reality, the conversations are far more enjoyable than expected, and result in much greater closeness than the shallow chit chat. We are particularly wary of revealing fears and vulnerabilities, which we believe will make us look weak. In reality, people tend to seek courage and honesty in our declarations a phenomenon called the beautiful mess effect. By practising greater self-disclosure in our lives and exposing our authentic personalities, we can put ourselves on the fast track to deeper friendship. Don't fear bragging and embrace Mitfreude. It's not just our weaknesses that we hide. Whether we have won a professional award or simply achieved a personal best at the gym, Many of us avoid sharing good news for fear that it will provoke jealousy. No one, we have been repeatedly told, likes a show-off. This advice has a strong historical precedence. If you want people to think well of you, do not speak well of yourself. The 17th century mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote in his Ponces. As I researched the laws of connection, I was surprised to find that our modesty is rarely rewarded. In general, other people tend to view our attempts to hide our achievements as paternalistic behaviour. It's as if you expect them to react like a spoiled child who always has to win a board game. Otherwise, they'll throw a tantrum. This feels very insulting, driving a wedge between us and the other person. Humble bragging. The act of veiling a success with a complaint fails for similar reasons. To have a successful interaction with someone, we need to know that they are acting honestly. But humble brag suggests that someone is making far too much effort to manage others' impressions. Someone who says, I am so sick of being mistaken for a celebrity, is considered to be less sincere and less likeable than someone who simply says, I'm often mistaken for a celebrity. Humble brags do not even convey the qualities that we wish to show off. So moaning about the fact that I am so exhausted of getting elected to leadership positions actually makes you look less competent than simply saying, I get elected to leadership positions. When we openly acknowledge our achievements, we create opportunities for Mitfreude. That's the pleasure that comes from rejoicing with others. You can see Mitfreude as the benign cousin of Schadenfreude our happiness at others' misfortune. And experiencing Mitfreude can be a powerful way of creating a deep connection. Don't fear asking for help, and engage in Am I? When we have a difficult problem to solve, far too many of us struggle alone rather than seeking support. We fear that others will see our request as a burden, and that they will either reject our entreaty, or quietly resent it and we believe that the mere act of asking will make us look weak. Once again, the research shows that these preoccupations are mostly unfounded. Scientists have investigated people's attitudes to helping over a huge range of tasks, from asking for directions to collecting money for charity. And in general, people are roughly twice as likely to assist us as we expect. We should always be mindful of the other responsibilities that someone may be carrying, of course. And we should accept a refusal with good grace. 
Provided that our requests are sensitive and respectful, however, many people will be genuinely happy to help. In many cases, asking for a favour can be a brilliant bonding experience, since it emphasises our trust and respect for the other person. Studies show that when you ask someone for assistance, even if it is a task that you could feasibly do by yourself, it primes the other person to feel closer to you. The Japanese language has a concept for this, am I? And many of us would be happier if we applied it more to our lives. Okay, I'm going to practice a little am I right now and ask you listeners for something that I can't do myself. And that's leaving a rating or review for this show in your podcast player. It's a nice, easy way you can help spread the power of good ideas and make a real contribution to your network of friends and colleagues. Okay, tomorrow we're going to hear from Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy, about how he thinks AI is about to revolutionize education for the good. I'm Michael Kavnet. See you then. <laughs>